Hi there, today's uh, Sunday, August 23rd, 2020, and I have not made a video like this in over a month since uh, the one I put out, could this be what happens by the end of the year. We have had a lot happen since then, and one thing in particular the Lord's pressed really earnestly on my heart is to share this message about my friend who was just murdered and the ramifications of that and what, what the Holy Spirit has spoken to my heart and to our family's heart and to the body of Christ. So uh, I'll call him Mark for his family's sake. My friend, we've been very close friends for the last almost five years. And uh, Mark was in our house just about every day in his early 70s, divorced. And uh, had, we were living in Panama. Some of you know that. We were in Panama, Central America for the last four and a half years. We moved back here in December to Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, my friend Mark, who I'm calling him, had moved there from the States a little before us. We had an English school at our home that my wife directed. Uh, Mark taught math in our school. My wife had an online business that Mark also worked for and did work for my wife in that business. He had Thanksgivings with us. He had Christmas dinners with us. He had birthdays with us. Very involved in the Christian community in Boquete, Panama, where we were in multiple rivers or streams of different Christian groups. Uh, very well loved, very well liked, funny, humorous. Uh, anyway, uh, was keeping a secret and uh, I had seen little signs off and on and, and just kind of brushed it off like, no, no, you know, there's something in the signs and where I'm going with this. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, back, there's so much to this story. Let me cut right to the chase because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to cut right to the chase to us and our hearts and getting our hearts right. And I think we're down to a very short amount of time to, to have that opportunity. Uh, back in November, the Holy Spirit gave me a prof prophetic thing, and this is terrible, it's hard, that, that my friend Mark was homosexual or bisexual and had me take him to dinner and confront him and point blank ask him about this boy I'll call Danny, who's 16 years old, who was his yard boy, and Danny had done work for me and had borrowed my lawnmower and had done odd jobs and had begged and asked me for money. I'd known uh, Danny, this Panamanian boy, since I guess he was 12 or 13. And... Uh, the Holy Spirit said these words, and this is harsh, but I'm telling you, and this is what happened. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to ask Mark, point blank, right now, I was sitting at the dinner table. I called him and said, I need to take you to dinner and, and talk with you, and I did. The Holy Spirit says, ask him if he was having oral sex with Danny right now. I leaned across the table and I said, Mark, are you having oral sex with Danny? And he went, Yes, and and then the whole truth came out, and then a lot of little signs I'd seen over the years started to make sense, and dots started to connect, and then this whole thing came out, and the saddest, or more sadness about what I would learn over the next few minutes is him telling me that he had left America and moved to Panama to get away from Christians that judged him for that, that basically I have a propensity for this and I've tried to quit and prayed about it and gave up and I had made an agreement, these were his exact words, to lie about it and that if anybody ever asked me here in Panama, I was just going to lie about it and I have been for years and you're the first person I've told the truth to. Again, long story with a lot more details. I want to get to the, the, the sobering, scary point of this. Did the biblical thing, uh, and I believed with my heart that night after Mark's response that he was not sorry for the sin, that he was sorry that he had been caught. I did the biblical thing and went to our pastor who was in a, this is very sad too, the, the Sunday night before, this was Saturday, uh, November 30th, two days after Thanksgiving, that Mark had had Thanksgiving dinner at my home for the fourth time, fourth year in a row, I believe. And uh, anyway, the Sunday night before I confronted him, uh, my wife and I were part of a leadership group with our church, and 
My friend Mark was part of that leadership group. The Sunday night before I'm confronting him and finding this out, he asks us in the leadership group from our church to please pray for Danny, this boy. And he says, John, you know Danny, my yard boy, and he's done stuff. Yeah, I know Danny. He said, he's such a good boy, and I love him so much, and I just am praying for his salvation and need him to be saved. And I just, would you pray for me right now? And we took the next 10 minutes and prayed for Mark and for Danny and for Danny's salvation. And I find out less than a week later that this 73-year-old man is having sex with him and has the audacity to stand up in our leadership meeting and ask us to pray for his salvation. And I said, Mark, do you realize you have wrecked that boy's life? I was molested by a neighbor when I was eight, nine years old. I was molested again when I was 13 by a band teacher who took me camping and raped me. And I know the consequences of it and how it wrecked my life for years. I said, you have wrecked his life. You have wrecked him and you think he's going to come to the Lord and you've wrecked how he's going to look at white men. You've wrecked how he's going to look at Americans. You've wrecked how he's going to look at God. You have wrecked him. Are you insane? And he's, well, da, 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 da. So I left that meeting and I wanted to hurt him myself and I'll come back to the point of that. I, you know, it, it obviously triggered me from my own past and I am sitting there processing all this in the minute there that this man that's been in my house for four years around my kids, teaching my kids math, hugging my kids is a pedophile. And I'm trying to hold it together on the outward when inside I'm wanting to come over the table and choke him or punch him or hurt him. And I do the next next morning, I call Pastor Mark and say, Mark, we got to talk and I got to tell you something. And I tell him the situation and he knew something was going on, just not to that level or degree. So we did the biblical thing and I go confront him and with the pastor. Uh, pastor actually didn't go with me, but said, you go and you tell him that you've told me and that I know and you go and proxy for me. His response was, cursing me, cursing our pastor, F you, F Mark, slamming the table in front of me. It scared me so bad, you guys. I got up and immediately, I mean, he manifested so bad that I got up and walked out the door and got in my car and drove off. There's more to the story, but not, you know, the biblical model, go to a brother if he's in sin, if he confesses, if he doesn't, take two or three witnesses. If he doesn't, take it to the church. If he doesn't, turn him over to the devil and have nothing to do with him. It got to that point. We got another brother in the Lord involved. There wasn't repentance in any of our opinions. There was sorrow for being caught. And uh, I left about three weeks later to come here to America and move here. So I was able to truly wash my hands of him and walk away and turn him over and leave. And I believe at this point it's two weeks ago, two Thursday mornings ago. Well, let me back up. About three weeks ago, for the first time in, what is that, nine months, ten months, nine and a half months, something like that, since I had that confrontation and then the next couple of days taking brothers, the pastor, and, and then writing him off. My wife fired him. We removed him from our home. And then two or three weeks later, we moved here to Nashville. And that nine months period up until about three weeks ago, I had continued to hate Mark. And if his a thought of him or a reminder of him would come up, I would just, ugh, God, I can't stand it. I'm so angry at him and I can't believe him and I can't believe he to see it. You know, da, da, da. about three weeks ago, the Holy Spirit, I'm down here on a street near our house and the Holy Spirit stops me and says, John, you have to forgive Mark not Pastor Mark, this person who I'm using the name Mark for that was in this secret sin. And I've changed his name again to protect this poor family here in the States that I've now been on the phone with. And I'm getting to that, what, what happened here. About three weeks ago, the Holy Spirit said, you have to forgive Mark. And I did, you guys. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, again, because of my personal experience as a child. That triggers me so bad. And I can say that before the Lord, I forgave this person. And then the Lord said, and you have to start praying for him. And over the next 10 days, two weeks, I know that at least 
five or six times the Holy Spirit would say, pray for Mark, pray earnestly about that sin in, the, in this lifestyle. And I did for the first time in nine months and did it from here. And then about uh, th two Thursdays ago, there's a, an open Bible study at a restaurant there, there in that town of Boquete, Panama. And it's a men's morning Bible study at 7 a.m. And anybody can come from any denomination or anything. I had, my son David was there, who still lives in Panama. And I've spoken with Andrew, who runs the Bible study, and confirmed this from both Andrew and my son David, who was there that this gentleman I'm speaking of, Mark, shows up at the Bible study and the Holy Spirit had told Andrew, who leads it, he didn't know Ken was, or Mark, he didn't know Mark was going to be there. And uh, the Lord told him to speak on sexual purity and repentance of sexual sin. And to hit it hard and not only talk about it, but gave him a video about it to share and he showed the video and, and to the effect, we have got to get sexual sin out of our lives. We've got to get our hearts clean. And then another brother in the Lord, Bob, who had a heart attack recently, speaks up in the meeting and says, yeah, you know, we, our life is like that. And we don't know when our number is going to be called. He said, you know, my life flashed before my eyes a few weeks ago. And it really sobered me up to thinking, man, I could die at any second. And then the conversation went to multiple other people in that community that have died over the last year or so that went to sleep and never woke up and people that weren't necessarily sick or unhealthy, you know, suddenlies. And they named some of those people and then the conversation went, what if we were, men here, what if we were to die tonight? Are we ready? And this person, Mark, who I'm talking of, again, not Pastor Mark, but the name I'm using, Mark, for this person. cavalierly speaks up and says, well, if I died tonight, I wonder what would happen to my dog. And I'm not going to say the dog's name. But Poor little thing, I wonder what would happen to him if I died tonight. Because he'd be locked in and couldn't get out or anybody couldn't get into him. That night, at approximately 7.19, Danny who I'm calling Danny, this 16-year-old boy shows up and knocks on the door, and we have texts of this. Mark was texting a friend, who I've also talked with now after the fact, that I know and I'm friends with on Facebook, Tim. I won't say Tim's last name. And is saying, I'm concerned about my yard boy. Now, Mark didn't bother telling Tim that I'm having sex with this 16-year-old boy, but does bother to tell him that he's gone crazy and I'm worried for my well-being. I'm He's gone so crazy on me that I'm worried he's going to hurt me. And then at 719, and I have a copy of this text screenshot, he's, Mark texts to Tim, he's at my door. If anything happens to me, his name is and gives his full name and he lives here and this is his address behind the gym in Alta Boquete. And Tim writes back, don't let him in. Well, he lets him in, gets naked, gets in the bed with him to have sex and Danny bludgeons, bludgeons him in the head and chokes him to death then robs his house, puts a pillow over Ken, uh, Mark's naked body, and leaves. You know, if I could go back to that morning, Thursday morning, and be in that Bible study, and hear Mark cavalierly say, if I died tonight, I wonder what would happen to my dog. I would say, uh, Mark, this is what's going to happen with your dog. Your dog, your dog's going to bark incessantly until your neighbor, who knows you very well and knows your dog, gets concerned because you've not come out of the house 
and she calls Andrew, who led the Bible study, unbeknownst to her, and tells him, and he gets another brother in the Lord, David, and they go over and kick your door down and find your naked, raped, murdered body. One last thing that I, I need to say about this. This guy I'm calling Mark, a prepper extraordinaire. He led a prepper's group. He had a WhatsApp prepper's group. He held meetings at this same restaurant for prepping. He had maps and escape routes. He was a leader in the prepper movement. He had a, a bug out bag extraordinaire sitting by his door, which I'd seen and gone through with him and had been in, in some of those meetings that he held. He had a second bug out bag in the trunk of his Lexus in case he was out to dinner when some tragedy happened or strike and couldn't make it home to get that bug out bag, uh, air mattress in his trunk, money hidden in cans in his yard, and the day he died was murdered, the bug out bag still sitting there in the, by the door, the bug out bag still in the trunk. The WhatsApp group still chit-chatting now with a whole new reason to chit-chat. Folks, this is an Ananias Sapphira moment for us and has been for me in my personal life to get things out of my life and God dealing with me and get my heart clean and right. And if you don't know the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, look it up. And they both died suddenly, and it said the fear of God filled the church. God's not playing, you guys. And it's not anger, though. There may be some anger or wrath of God. It's his mercy because time's short, and God disciplines those he loves. And he was reaching and reaching out to Ken. I know because I wanted to hate Ken, and in the last two weeks of his life, after not even praying for him, caring about him, wanting to hate him, the Holy Spirit required me to forgive him and start praying for him. The morning of his death, he leads a man to lead a Bible study and got Ken there somehow to repent of your sexual sin. And he makes a joke about it and his life's required of him that night. You can do all the prepping you want in the natural. If, if your and my hearts aren't prepped, it isn't going to do a bit of good. Anyway, I, that's all I'll say for now. I pray for you and whoever hears this. Let us get right with God and get our hearts clean and get habitual sins out of our lives. Judgment's coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Anyway, enough said. I love you. God bless you. May God help us.